Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to this Tuesday, May 16th edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, no Joel today. He had to run out of town, but I'm here with Dennis Dick, and we are jam-packed with guests for you today. Three guests on the docket. Our first guest will be at 8.15. That's Mark Chaikin. He is the founder and CEO of Chaikin Analytics, and we're going to be joined, as we are, every Tuesday at 8.35 by Nick Shaheen our resident options expert, the author of Create Income with Option Spreads on MarketFi. And then at 8.55, we're going to have Jeff Goldman, the author of Failed Traders, 20 Common Mistakes Committed by Over 1,000 Losing Traders. He's going to tell us about uh, dry ships and how this thing is allowed to go on the way it's been going on. But before we get to that, we got to get to some earnings. We've got to get to some 13 Fs, get to some ratings. We're going to bring in Dennis. Dennis, how's it going today? Not going pretty good. Market looks quiet, but we have some individual stock movers here, as we always do. And it is 13F season. We talked about a few from Friday night, but there was a ton that came out last night. We heard from Buffett. We heard from Icon. We heard from Soros. We heard from everybody there, Spencer. Uh, first, let's bring in the Brentster, though. And Brentster can yeah. uh, come on and just explain, you know, 13Fs, what exactly, you know, we're looking for at the Benzinga News Desk when they bring, break you this news and why it's relevant. Yep. Brentster, are you kicking around? Hey. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Brent. So why don't you give us, uh, our, our, our new listeners a quick breakdown. I'll, I'll break down what exactly the, 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 the new holdings are, but you can just give us a quick summary of 13Fs and what we're looking at and how you guys uh, – Hey guys, get All right. Pro. All right, cool. So, um, real quick, just remember that these are coming 45 days after the end of the quarter. So, you you don't you, I don't think you're going to be exactly trading a ton of breaking news on this stuff. Obviously, the Hertz yesterday, Dennis, we can talk a little bit about, but for the most yeah. part, these 13F lines, they're not going to be hugely surprising to people and remember that you're looking 45 day, at least 45 days back. So, I would say these are really good if you want to follow along with your favorite hedge fund manager. The way that I sort of look at the 13Fs is I love to look for the trends. I love to look for the themes. I love to look to see, you know, why did we have three or four notable funds going into airlines this quarter? And I'm just, I'm not, I'm just saying that I'm not, uh, that not actually the case. Uh, let me break down really quickly a couple of the relevant names that I think you can look for. You definitely want to look. Uh, the big one is definitely Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. Carl Icahn um, is notable to watch. However, he doesn't do a ton within the quarter. Same thing with Bill Ackman and Pershing Square. They don't have a ton of holdings, um, so they're, it, it doesn't take a long time to go through them. But a lot of those changes, they don't happen very frequently with those big funds. A couple other big names I think you should tune into. Greenlight, that's David Einhorn. That one's notable. Uh, Dan Loeb at third point. That one's notable. Um, who else? Kanikos is, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jim Chanos. Uh, also, who's a good one here? Um, Soros, you mentioned him. George Soros is an all right one. He has a ton of holdings. So in a sec, I'm going to kind of really quickly go into how the news desk breaks these down. And with yeah. somebody like Soros, who has a lot of holdings, it's a lot less easy to go through them quickly. So you sort of, if you are trying to, if you are a trader or investor who is kind of trying to go through these 13Fs quickly and break them down yourself, I would advise that you stay to the funds that don't have a ton of holdings. If you look at like the... Point, Where do you get this raw information? from yeah, Edgar? sure. Or yep, Edgar. It is Edgar. And uh, if you want a real quick breakdown, on how you can do this yourself. I mean, tune into Benzinga Pro because we're re we're pretty good at this, so we can get you headlines out there really quick. If you do want to go do the the raw digging yourself, what you should do is you go to Edgar. You just go to sec.gov, find the Edgar company search. You find the company search field. You type in as close as you can the exact fund. And if you don't know exactly what the fund's called, then just sort of start generalizing and work from there. If you know it's 0.72 and it's LLC, you do have to find that LLC eventually, but you can kind of drill down if you just say general. So what you should do here is, you know, let's take uh, Greenlight, Greenlight, for example, David Einhorn's fund. 
if you want to dig into Greenlight a little bit, what you do is type in Greenlight in the field, get to his filings, and you're going to need to look for at least two of the uh, last 13F fountains. You're going to want to find the most recent one with the updates, and then you should go back at least another quarter and find that 13F. Pop them both out in Windows, put, put them next to each other on your desktop, and then all you really have to do is, you know, it's SEC, it's very formulaic, it's very cookie cutter how the format is. So what you can do is you can just go right down the line, and if you see, you know, Apple at the top, and you see Apple at the top of the recent filing, you're like, okay, he didn't do anything with his, uh, he didn't take a new stake, he didn't liquidate his stake, okay, did he change his position at all? And it shows you right in the filings how many shares they have. And it'll also show you uh, options contracts. If they have calls or puts uh, on a fund, uh, excuse me, on a holding, it will be disclosed. However, the one thing that I do want to note is short positions are not going to be disclosed. So if, you know, Pershing Square is shorting, uh, some name out there, it is again not going to be inside of that. Why program. is that, Brent? Why don't they have to disclose the short positions? Well, they're not actually they're not actually holding it, right? They're they're right. selling it, right? So it's 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 that's practical. a good point. It's logical, right? Um, however, you will hear about these days when these funds like Greenlight will send out their last quarter letter to investors and you'll usually get those before you get the filings and if you are looking to understand what some of the funds are doing on the short side that is probably where you're going to get your answer because a lot of times they will disclose some of their short positions in their inv uh, investor letter again they will not they do not have to disclose that in the 13f filing wonderful thanks yeah, so much Brent. no problem at all all right that was that was a great explanation right there so i knew i know he's good at yeah explaining yeah that. he explains it very well all right so that, so let's get to what actually uh went down yesterday after the dell so carl icons 13f came out yesterday they he is out of allergan agn uh he has a new stake in uh well-built wbt a stake in conduit cndt uh what else what's this what's a conduit symbol uh, C N D T and also C N D T. Yep, C N D T, and then also and that, and that is bit up in the pre market. That actually, because a smaller company, yep. those are really notable. When you see something like that, a smaller company with a new position, yep. it will really move the stock. Last night, this this closed seventeen oh five. Last night, after this broke, this was stock was actively trading up at seventeen fifty. This morning, it's already bid at seventeen sixty. Yep. So yeah, nobody's hitting that bid. So you can tell this thing could be up three, four, five percent just because Icon took a position. Yep, and also uh, WBT there uh, for Icon. Uh, Buffett came out yesterday at around 440. He has reduced. We know he cut his stake in IBM. He is also out of 21st Century Fox. Fox A is a ticker there and has raised his stake in Apple. He has raised his stake in American Airlines. Uh, and those are the most notable from Buffett. As far as George Soros, the, he is out of Delta, eBay, and Cigna. So he's out of all of those positions. He has raised his stake, Soros has, in American Airlines, in Facebook, in Goldman Sachs, and in HPE, uh, HP Enterprises. And he has reduced his stake in Netflix. Uh, then we had this Hertz thing, which we can we can discuss briefly. Uh, reported, I think, by Bloomberg. I'm I'm not sure who broke it. Um, it, if it was it, actually Bloomberg, I, but I, I, you know, I think you know there, there there was reported. A few people were saying it was from Bloomberg. It was reported that Hertz. Had um, no, uh, Buffett perfect. had taken a new position in Hertz, and Hertz, if you look at the after hours chart, I'm not sure if you can show that right now there, uh, Spencer, but Hertz popped over 10% on the snooze last night. And then it was reported about five minutes later that that was not true, and it was not there was not a new position, and Hertz tanked all the way back down. So Lori popped 10%, the Buffett was in Hertz, and then it was like, oops, no, he's not, and it, then it fell all the way back down. So in Hertz, we know it's been in a world of Hertz. So it would have been a huge confidence boost for you know a, a person like Warren Buffett to take a position in that. And that was not the case. So inaccurately reported. Not sure where that mistake happened, uh, but obviously you know some people got burned on that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that so that was that was the Hertz, and so that was Buffett, that was Icon, that was Soros, Ackman. Uh, his 13F his sh shows uh, reduced stakes in uh, air products, APD, Mondelez, and of course we know he's out of Valiant. Uh, Barry Rosenstein's Jana uh, came out. He has a new position in Whole Foods. Black Hawk Networks, which is uh, Hawk is the ticker. Dow Chemical he's in. HPE he's in. Uh, Sherwin-Williams he's in. Shire, Snap, Tiffany 
He's in all those stocks. He's out. Uh, Rosenstein, Barry Rosenstein is out of Yum and Tesla. So uh, we can throw all that in the chat at some point. Uh, yeah. That, so so that's in summary track. here, you know, there's lots of news. And what you want to note is, you know, really the new positions or, you know, the exiting positions. But it's really the new positions that really get the pop. So, you know, the one that I, you know, had written down was an icon with that smaller company there. Um, and, 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 and it can move the stock. So as a long-term investor, and, you know, and Kramer was talking about this on Mad Money last night, and he's making a great point, And we've made the same point on pre-market prep lots of times. It's difficult to just chase these guys because this is from 45 days ago when uh when it was disclosed on cnbc that warren buffett had sold shares of ibm um you know this was up in the 180s you know 45 days ago and that's where he had sold it now the stock's at 151 so if you're coming out you know here last night saying i'm selling ibm because warren sold some ibm this is you know you're late to the party here um because the stock's at 151 he sold up at 180 so you're missing most of the move so it's difficult to just say because these guys are buying a stock or selling a stock, I'm going to do the same thing because the information is so old. It's from 45 days ago. So you know sometimes you can get a better price than these guys. And, you know, and, and there is you know some people who just actively just follow their favorite fund managers and just try to do their positions. But it's difficult because you're always chasing them. And I think any alpha you can extract from you know their knowledge is lost because the data is 45 days old. So why do you know? So you can say, well, what's what, what's the point to listening to any of this? Well, the point is you have to know, especially if you're a short-term trader, that there is going to be movement in those individual securities because there is people that are chasing these things. So you need to know if you know um, he has a new, if Warren Buffett has a new position, or if Icon and give us that symbol again, the one, the main one that Icon got, the yeah, small company. C N D T. It's conduit. C N D T. So you need to know that information because Conduit right now is trading up 4.1%. And that is, the whole reason for that is because Icon bought in, and bought into the stock. So um, obviously, if you're trading some of these smaller companies, they can really move on it. But sometimes the bigger companies can move too. So it's it's very relevant information to day traders and to you know short-term swing traders. I'd say long-term investors, I hate chasing these things if you're a long-term investor. I just think it's a bad idea. Well, there, there's a common, there's a prevailing uh, sentiment that you know it is, it is possible to just follow along with the, what the, what the big, you know, hedge funds are doing. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's one strategy. If you're, if you're a long-term investor, not if you're a trader. If you're a long-term investor, but, it's one strategy. Yeah, yeah, you're always going to be late. Yes, you're, always, that's 100 percent true. You're always going to be late. But you know, there are resources uh, that make, uh, the, you know, this information easy, easy to consume. Uh, and it, it is a thing people do, you know, like or not, it, it, is, it, a, is. it is a thing people do. So it, it's completely a thing that people do. And that's why you need to know that even if you're a long-term investor, you need to know that. And maybe it's going to be your out, you know, maybe that's going to be the case. Okay. Let's say, you know, even long-term you were short IBM and now, you know, you heard Warren Buffett had sold and now it's come down and now it gets down another, you know, five points. And this was disclosed on CNBC. You can see the big sell-off, uh, which was, uh, you know, a week and a half ago when, when he, when it was said that Buffett had actually sold some of his IBM stake, yep. and the stock went from 159 down to 154. Mm. Maybe that's going to be your out. Maybe you're going to say, okay, well, I, I know that information here now. It's 30 points, and I'm going to cover. You know, there's lots of different ways to play this. The, the main main point is it is market moving information, and it can be more moving than sometimes even the earnings reports themselves. So that's why you need to you know follow this information, and it is relevant to all traders and investors. But the point I was just making is I think if you're just blindly following what these guys are doing, I think it's a tough strategy. To oh, make money I, I I agree. And and like you said with with uh you know with uh with Hertz where it, it you know if that had if that had been true, that's a big confidence boost. So if you if, if you're a long term investor, you know you need to know when Warren Buffett is getting into your in, into your stock. That, that's a confidence boost right there. So. Uh, something to keep in mind uh, as, as as we get through 13F season. Uh, 8.14, 8.15 now. We're going to take our first break of the day. We're going to grab our first guest. He is Mark Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics. We'll be right back with Mr. Chaikin.
All right, welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel, here with, jo uh, not no Joel today, but Dennis Dick, and we're on the line now with Mark Chaikin, founder of Chaikin Analytics. Mark, how's it going today? Uh, very well. Good morning, Spencer. I hope you have recovered from the Benzinga Fintech Awards, because it was, uh, you, you were there, you, yep. you actually, uh, Chaikin Analytics won uh, an award, so congr congratulations. And uh, but I hope you've had time to recover. I have, and congratulations for Benziga for uh, getting such a great turnout and uh, really doing an extraordinary job of highlighting what's going on in innovation and financial technology. Yeah, definitely a good event. You, you were also on a panel, Mark, with, uh, with Adam Dell and uh, and Gene Munster. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not not Gene Munster. You were on a panel with Adam Dell and um, who's the third one now? Oh gosh. It Seth, was Maron Seth from Maron. Liquid Seth Maron. Maron. Yes, it was you, Adam, and Seth Maron. That 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 was one of my favorites. Uh, so uh, that was a good one. You were on the, uh, you were, you were there. You were exhibiting. You were giving a demo. Uh, you guys were all over the place. Uh, it was it was a great event, and uh, we're glad you guys could uh, could make it and have some fun. So let's let's talk about the market. You guys, you have your uh, your shaken power gauge, and you just recently uh, a few weeks ago started doing a morning newsletter. The um, the the the, the chicken power feed. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the power feed was meant to fill a need uh, for uh, individual investors uh, who don't want to sit in front of CNBC for an hour and a half in the morning to find out what happened yesterday and what's likely to go on today. So what we've done is to combine market moving. Uh, events and headlines with the chicken power gauge intellectual property in a what we call a market in a minute very fast read, but it's mobile friendly, it's graphically oriented. So uh, over and above the five bullet points that my colleague John Schlitz writes for our morning market commentary, everything is sort of auto generated and breezy, but valuable, actionable information about not just about what happened yesterday, but what's attractive in the market today. So you have, uh, I mentioned your, your, your chicken power gauge or your 20 factor model uh, that you're using to walk the market as part of your platform, Chicken Analytics. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, about, is there anything on your radar these days that you're watching in the market? Well, I am. I'm uh, noticing uh, the big explosion in large cap tech stocks. Uh, so we're actually looking for opportunities in smaller cap semiconductor stocks. Uh, that may have been overlooked, uh, particularly where there have been positive earnings surprises. So we have three stocks that we've identified, Acellus, ACLS, Kohu, COHU, and Integris, ENTG. All of these companies spiked up uh, on their recent positive earnings surprises, and they've now pulled back to the point where we think they're attractive. And uh, very often in the small cap space, you can find hidden gems, and our Chaikin Power Gauge rating, which uh, synthesizes these 20 key factors, value, growth, sentiment, and technicals, is a great way to find hidden gems in the small cap area. So, so what, uh, let's go further into detail on that. What uh, exactly uh, made these, those three stocks jump out to you? They, they, they jumped and they pulled back, but what else about them kind of got, got your attention? Well, the technicals are very strong on these stocks. They're also making new highs along with the larger cap names like LAM Research and Applied Materials. But it's these positive earnings surprises in small cap stocks uh, where they're typically under followed by Wall Street analysts. And that is one of the factors in our model. In fact, those are two of the factors, earnings surprise and Wall Street analyst estimate revisions. When these small cap stocks report positive earnings surprises, and they've got solid technicals and fundamentals to go with it. You see a pattern of analysts starting to raise their estimates and new analysts starting to follow the stocks. And this is sort of a virtuous syndrome or virtuous circle that often leads, especially after a pullback like we've just seen in the past five to six days in these stocks, to higher prices, much higher prices in many cases ahead. Mark, real quick, can you repeat? I got ACLS. What was the other two that you mentioned? Kohu, C O H U, and Integris, E N T G. Okay, got it for a chat there. Uh, and there's no particular, there's no specific type of stock that you, that 
that that you have as as like as like your wheelhouse, right? You're looking wherever your model takes you is where you're willing to go, right? There's nothing, there's no specific market cap or sector that you that you that you specialize in. You're everywhere. It's whatever the whatever your model tells you. That's that's what dictates uh, your your attention, correct? That's correct, Spencer. And the reason is that the model is robust and it's broad based. It's not just looking at value metrics or um, growth metrics or small or large cap, it, it's, uh, it synthesizes all of these and it finds a lot of different ways to like stocks. So right now the, the model just recently turned bullish on Apple, uh, admittedly after a big move, but it's been bullish on some of the suppliers to Apple like uh, Cirrus, Logic and Skyworks. So uh, we're just talking about tech here, but there are many other sectors that have uh, stocks with bullish ratings. But in the tech sector, it's obvious that there are some winners and losers. For instance, Qualcomm, even though one of the great uh, value in, investors, Seth Klarman, was just quoted as saying that he took an enormous position, I think about $750 million in Qualcomm, that stock has a bearish rating in our model. So uh, I'm going to go with the power gauge rating in spite of the fact that Seth Klarman, uh, second to none, perhaps to Warren Buffett in terms of his long-term track record, is buying a big position. The power gauge rating is bearish. Institutions continue to sell the stock. So uh, I'm going to go with an objective, unbiased model over uh, monitoring the filings of, of um, successful hedge fund investors or, or value investors. I'm actually glad you brought that up because we just had a, a discussion prior to you coming on about 13Fs and whether or not it's, it's, it's prudent or useful as a trader or investor to pay attention to these filings. I mean, there are they are 45 days after the fact, so you don't pay attention to 13Fs in that way. I don't. I'll occasionally uh, assemble a list of the largest uh, new additions through 13F filings, but then I'm going to filter them through the lens of the Chaikin power gauge rating, and the Qualcomm example is a perfect one. Uh, Seth Klarman is quoted as having bought big stakes in Corvo, and Qualcomm, I immediately saw that Qualcomm is bearish, so I'm just going to take that off my radar screen. Uh, I'm only interested in stocks that the big boys are accumulating if the power gauge rating, which is my go-to objective model, confirms what they're seeing. Uh, I'd be remiss, Mark, if I didn't mention uh, your new ETF, the IQ Chicken ETF. Uh, I know you're limited to what you can say, but it it does relate to the the Nasdaq uh, Chicken Power Index, correct? Which you, which you can talk about. It does. The Nasdaq. We created three indexes for Nasdaq uh, starting on April of 19, of 2014. Uh, they're rebalanced annually, and they use the power gauge rating as the uh, discriminator to narrow down, in the case of the small cap universe, 1,500 stocks in the NASDAQ uh, U.S. small cap 1,500 index, which closely tracks the Russell 2000, to the best of the best. So uh, to get into the NASDAQ Chaikin small cap index, which the ETF is based on, uh, you have to have a very bullish power gauge rating. Uh, what then happens is uh, that the index uh, stays in place for a year and is rebalanced uh, 12 months later. So uh, it's quite interesting that the index itself has outperformed its benchmark by 100% or 2,000 basis points in the three years that it's been in existence. It really shows that the Chaikin power gauge rating has implications not just for traders, or intermediate term investors, but for longer term buy and hold investors, because the index by its nature is a buy and hold index. So if you want access to, uh, if you want a way to invest in the in this index, you now have uh, an ETF that you can do so, the uh, Chaikin, uh, eat the IQ Chaikin uh, ETF. And if you want to learn more about uh, the Chicken Power Gauge and how you can actually see what it's saying. You can go to chickenanalytics.com. Uh, it's all on Mark's platform there. Mark, thank you so much for hopping out with us today. We will talk to you again soon. Spencer, it's always a pleasure. Thanks very much. Always a pleasure as well. All right, 827 now. Dennis, are we getting any action in the three stocks Mark mentioned? Um, 
not not yet here okay. at Zero. These are smaller companies, though, obviously. So, you know, you've got the ACLS and ENTG he mentioned and COHU, just to recap those. And they're typically in the pre-market, just, you know, to, to let you know, usually the small caps have very little action. Most reactions in the large caps. The odd time you will see some action, you know. Obviously, when Icon takes a position on something, you can see some action. But they're just illiquid. There's just not much happening. So sometimes, you know, during the regular session, then you'll see some movement there. So And I should, um, I, I should what mention, some, yep, I should mention yeah. CSML is a symbol for the ETF. CSML. That's Mark. Yep, okay. that that's Mark's uh, ETF uh, based on based on the index, based on the power gauge. Uh, so CSML cool. there. All right, eight twenty eight, Dennis. We we haven't covered um, a single uh, earning stock <laughs> <laughs> or, or news stock. Well, well, I guess we have the thirteen house well, covered. So oh, yeah, we got to jump into the, the earnings here. We're in retail earnings season. We got the big guns coming this week, like we've already said, and we heard from one big gun here this morning, and that is Home Depot. And Home Depot, the monster stock that it is, is kicking up and sitting right here, perched at a new all-time high here once again. Spencer, what are the numbers from Home Depot? Home Depot Q1 EPS a buck sixty-seven versus a buck sixty-one. Sales of twenty. 23.88 versus 23.72 billion dollars so beat on the top and a beat on the bottom for good old hd it just keeps marching and you know this is one you know that i really kick myself because i owned home depot in my investment portfolio way back in like 2002 and you know what i Pichard. sold it yeah and i sold it i think in like 2012 i had it in like 10 years and you know, I sold it like 50 or 60 bucks, and I made some good money on it. It's 157 dollars now, though. So I guess you know maybe when you have, you know you make some money, you should always hold on to a piece because sometimes you know this can really work out. So obviously this would have been a great long-term holding for me, and I had it for a long time. There's but a 15-year chart. Here, There's a 15-year chart up on the screen right now. So you had it at, at 17? Uh, no, you had around it. 30. I can't remember the years I bought it. I think I originally bought around 32 bucks. Okay. That was my original entry point. So um, let me just go look here at the screen with you, so I can try to figure out. You know, it's, when you're holding something that many years to get the year exactly <laughs> right, it's hard to figure out. But I can just remember kind of the price, and it was around 32 dollars. And when it got up to I think 50 or 60, I felt like you know it was a getting a little bit extended there and i was dead wrong because obviously it continued to run and continued to run and now it's 157 159 dollars it's 160 bucks right now so obviously in a long-term investing does work sometimes wish i would have held that one a little bit longer but anyways you know talking about the stock itself home depot the only technical number i'll give you is 160 bucks because that's the, right now where we're trading at um that's you know the all-time high here at least in the pre-market and it's a big psychological round number 160 can it take it out sure it can will it take it out I don't know, probably. I mean, this thing just keeps on marching. So it's been a difficult stock to be short. And you think about all the trouble that all the retailers have. The one thing Lowe's and Home Depot have not had, and maybe it's because it's difficult to get lumber online. <laughs> I, I was going to say, you took the words out of my mouth. I forget who it was. It may have been Ryan Craver. It may have been someone else. And I, I think this was last quarter. But they were saying, right, I mean, Home Depot and Lowe's, the one thing they haven't had to deal with is people buying online, or at least they buy online, but they still have to go to the store to pick up all that stuff they bought. So th there's no delivery of, of, of you know, of, of wood panels and, and picture frames or whatever, whatever it is, or, or sinks or whatever you're buying at Home Depot. You have to go pick that up yourself. And so they don't have any problem getting, getting foot traffic, which <laughs> – And the people – and the people want it. I mean, when you're a contractor right. there, do right. you really want to place an order here two days before for the job you're going to get? Sometimes you don't even know, you know. And I mean, you could get same day delivery and stuff, but it can't be that cheap to deliver, you know, a load of lumber too. Do they even? They must sell it. They must sell it online. Of they sell everything of course, on Amazon. Of course they do. Of course they I just sell think it of online. the practicalness of it. You know, it's the same thing with groceries. You know, it's, is it really practical? I mean, they'll figure it out. I mean, Amazon figures everything out. It seems like, but. I just know Home Depot lows whenever you go in, and those stores are busy. I go to home, my Home Depot all the time. Yep. Um, obviously, whenever you got a home project, I just like, okay, I need this. I hop over to Home Depot. It's yep. like 10 minutes away. Yep. Pick up what I need, bring it back. Exactly. So, exactly. That's all what right. everybody else apparently does too because the stock keeps going up. <laughs> and then you've got Lowe's, L O W, which is uh, probably having a little sympathy move here, and it is this morning. L O W trading up almost 1%, 85.78. Um, 86 bucks, a big technical number here for Lowe's, L-O-W. I'm just going to quickly look here. Uh, oops. Speaking I'm of, just quickly looking at the $86. I got the show play in the background. Here. Speak, Sorry, speaking, of Lowe's, um, uh, speaking of Lowe's uh, and 13Fs, uh, Cooperman took a new position in, in Lowe's. 
<laughs> uh, yesterday. Ace box looks big, but again, this is just, you know, it seems like every number keeps getting taken out. So yep. uh, that's one technical level that I would just look at if we thrown out some technical resistance. 86 bucks. What about DKS, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods? They, report, uh, they reported this morning. Oh, and seven. you know what? I had in my head, I was like, I had my finger on the trigger. I was like, I almost want to short this going into the report because it just seems like the kind of stock that is going to miss. I mean, there's been so many retail carnage here. It really has been. After the Macy's and the Nordstrom and the Coles there last week, all those stocks got destroyed. Um, we've seen some other ones you know, that haven't done well either. I just had a feeling that Dix was going to not do well. Give us the numbers here, Spencer. I'm kicking myself because it's down 12%. Yeah, well, Q1 EPS, $0.54 cents is in line with the estimate sales of $1.83 versus $1.84 billion, so just below that number they see. Q2 EPS at $1.02 dollar and five cents that is higher than the one dollar estimate uh fiscal year eps is also uh in line so good but not great and they're hitting it they're hitting it hard it's down here 12 percent here now am i coming in and picking a bottom now uh, 4150. There's somebody selling 48,000 shares now on the off. This is serious institutional selling here now. 506,000 shares already traded here. It's taking out the lows. Go out to the weeklies and you got to go and look. And you know where it looks like it wants to go is at 40. You had multiple lows back in June, July of 2016. So going back almost a year ago. Um, and the $40 area, I feel like that's where it wants to go. I feel like it's almost a magnet here now. So um, it's difficult to come in here at 4130 and think it's not maybe eventually going to trade the 40. All right, 834. Let's take our second break of the day. And <laughs> Connor McDavid gets his sticks from Dick Sporting Goods. Let's go grab. You <laughs> <laughs> know I'm an Oilers fan of a chat. <laughs> let, let, let's go grab uh, Nick Shaheen, author of Creating Income with Option Spreads, our, uh, our go to uh, options expert on every Tuesday at this time. Uh, Nick, actually, I heard Nick did a, did a good job uh, last week uh, co hosting the show. So we'll ask him, we'll ask him what that was like uh, a full show uh, with Joel. But we'll be right back with Mr. Uh, Sheen. Welcome back, traders and investors. We're on the line now with Nick Shaheen. He's the author of Create Income with Option Spreads on Market Find. Nick, what was it like last week going a full show with Joel? Uh, it was tons of fun. You know, it was uh, somewhat easy because uh, I've listened to the show before and I know sure. how you guys run it. So sure. it was a lot of fun. Great. Well, glad you could do it. I know Joel had a lot of fun. Uh, got kick me and Dennis out for a day and just eat the two of you. And I know he liked it. So uh, what are you watching this morning? Um, I'm watching kind of everything uh, for, uh, I have a few longs, uh, I'm long Intel, I'm long Disney after shorting it on the break of the uh, prior trend. Watching the market overall, of course, the ES, uh, watching if it's going to set a prior day high or break it, uh, they could overshoot to 24.12 to 15, which would be target one. They may meander up there. I don't know if they're going to burst into it. Uh, they've been, they, they being the bulls seem pretty shy re recently. So uh, it all depends on on that. And if that happens, the small caps have some catch up to do. Uh, so even though they were up one percent at one point yesterday, but uh, they're still relatively to what they've done before. They haven't lived up to the expectations. The open interest says they should be higher. Say the IWM should be over 140, but uh, they're not. They haven't taken it since last week. Nick, let's just, uh, we've been talking retailers. We're in retail earnings season here right now. We heard from Home Depot. We heard from TJX this morning. We're going to hear from Target and Walmart. Uh, but last week, we just had an absolute massacre from some stocks that have been just continued to get killed. We saw Macy's get destroyed, Nordstrom get destroyed, and Kohl's get destroyed. I mean, these department stores all feel like they're going the way of J.C. Penney here. What's Nick Shaheen's thoughts here, you know, as we look here, you know, at a Macy's now, um, you know, M, uh, $23. It's got a 6.5% dividend yield. I got to think that dividend is in jeopardy there when it's trading up that much. What are your thoughts here on a stock like this? Um, I, I think that strategically, I cannot believe they put themselves in this position. Uh, and I say that very confidently because uh, 
I remember when Amazon was rising, uh, it didn't get the kudos or the attention it deserved, and they waited and waited more than a decade to do something about it. And now that they are scrambling to do something about it, they're making mistakes all over the place, like uh, trying to shift everything online. And notice I said shift because they're cannibalizing their own sales and making it more convenient to their customers at their own expense. They're spending extra to make that happen instead of trying to eat into the other person's lunch they're trying to eat into their own foot traffic lunch which i i don't know how they're going to solve that problem they waited too long it's kind of like if you have a bad option strategy going bad and you don't do anything until the last minute it becomes almost impossible to save it if you're selling spreads you know what i mean um uh, it they i they waited too late i don't know how the heck they're going to get themselves out of there so why bother with it uh, there, there is some retail that is not brick and mortar typical uh, stores like Macy's, uh, and that's where I would uh, concentrate. Walmart could be one of them because Walmart's ace has been uh, the low pl- price leader. So if I need something and I find it uh, at Walmart or Costco, chances are that's the cheapest where I can find it, and it's right there. And, and they do ubiqu- Amazon price matching too. And not only that, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. I mean, anywhere you go, there's a Walmart or Costco around you. At least around me, there is, unless you live out um, where you, you know, out somewhere out way away from cities. And, and so these two, I would play with uh, Walmart and Costco, for example, or anything like that. Why mess with the Macy's of the world and trying to catch a falling knife where they don't even know what they're doing? They'd be yeah. in the management. So I'd stay away from them. It's a hideous chart. So <laughs> hideous is a good description of that shirt there, Nick. Uh, from the chat, Brad wants to know your, your thoughts on crude. We'll come back a little bit from the lows. Okay. Uh, crude, my thought is, I'll say it in plain, simple English, it's all about OPEC, really, uh, because they're the ones that drove the price down to the 30 area when everything fell off the hinges there. So OPEC, 53 plus is too expensive because OPEC loses market share. And 53 is not a hard line in the sand. It's an area. Um, below 45, 40, you know, 47 to and, and lower, uh, it would hit them in their pocketbook. It's bad for their pockets. So anywhere in between is a tradable zone. When it recently dipped, I sold naked puts in the USO very confidently. And it's been money that I didn't even look at the put sold. I sold it at $9 for several months out. So uh, I collected premium and I'll just wait for it to die. I'm not chasing crude to go to 60, even though technically it should have gone there and it didn't. Uh, I'm not chasing crude to go to 40 uh, or lower because even if it goes, it's going to be there only for a fraction period of time. So there is a band of crude where it's trading and I call it the OPEC put. And it, I guess it, it's an OPEC zone because it. I think logically it should stay in there. Now, headlines will move it here and there, but um, this is where the the – the logical place for crude to be is in that zone. I know it's a wide zone, but it's totally tradable via the options. Uh, so, yeah, that's so it's where I, 30 where you're confident of selling? Uh, oh, no, those? no, no. Way above that. Oh, way um, above that. Yeah. When we recently dipped to the 45 area, yeah. I sold naked puts in the U.S. So at $9, which would have left another 10, 15% room from where CL so was. So down to like 40 Yes, and uh, if you want to translate it, you know, eyeball. Uh, so from the recent low, I left a lot of room below it, and then I committed. Okay, so if the USO, if the crude falls another 10, 15 percent, I'll be a buyer of the USO at that price, um, and my break-even point would have been even lower than that because I collected premium. So that that's the kind of trade I'm doing on crude. Now I could have bought some calls with it too, but I didn't want to, so I just figured I'd collect the premium and sit on it for a while. What about individual stocks? I look at Halliburton, Schlumberger, um, even Exxon Chevron. Those things all got beat up, but they've all kind of started to form a bottom here. Like, I mean, Halliburton, for instance, HAL, yeah. has been an ugly downtrend. I mean, in February, it was 58 bucks. It just fell under 44 there just about a week and a half ago. But now it's trying to climb its way out, and it looks like it's trying to break that downtrend a little bit there. What do you think on a stock like Halliburton, HAL? I'm going to answer your question on Chevron. Okay, I'm let's do Chevron. <laughs> um, they all look the same. <laughs> so. Well, well the, the, reason, the, the reason why is that's what I did. I did a little video for the members, and I said, here are a couple that could be long. Uh, it was Exxon and Chevron. It was a, a few last week or maybe two weeks ago, so it was at the lows. And I said, you know, they have come to a place where I see support below. So I sold puts and put spreads way below, way out in time, kind of a, a, a trade designed to be boring. 
And uh, I don't want to share the exact trade, but something that I wouldn't have to look at if I'm going on vacation, which I am next month. So uh, th this way, I don't have to mo monitor my, you know, tick by tick. I know where my level is. It would take a crash for me to be a, a loser on that one. So in Plus essence, a four like four percent dividend on Chevron. So right, but know, I'm not dividend protection too. I'm not collecting that because I'm. But I mean, options, yeah. But but yeah. at a certain point, you know, yeah. the stock's probably not going to fall that hard because the dividend starts to cushion the blow. So you yeah. know, if you are selling puts, even though you're not directly benefiting, you kind of are because it puts yeah. like that downward, you know, support level in that you know value investors like myself that I like five percent dividends. Whenever something gets five percent, I start licking my chops if I think it's safe, and I usually jump in. I know there's a lot of dividend collectors like me that do the same thing. Yep, and you 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 once said it uh, best is uh, when I sell a put or put spread, I'm basically selling somebody a lottery ticket that by design I'm hoping it loses money for them uh, and makes me money. So uh, there's a lot of people there. There were a lot of people when when these guys were falling, expecting much falling, much more redness, and therefore they bought the puts I sold. Either that, or they're trying to protect their own stock at that level. So uh, that's the kind of trades I'm doing in an in a all-time high environment. Uh, I got I can't buy stuff with no room for error at all-time high. So consider if I bought the stock at 100 bucks, I'm risking my money right now completely and it and statistically it's a coin flip really. It could go up and go down and I have no room for error. I can do homework to skew that in my favor, but um, you know, there's no cushion when I sell a put, I'm basically collecting money for the opportunity to buy the stock cheaper. Uh, that's the kind of investing I like to do. Nick, uh, Brad also wants to hear, know your opinion on Alibaba. We are going to hear from Alibaba on Thursday. And this stock made a new all-time high here again. I mean, this stock has just been in an incredible march. Really, you know, since it made those lows back in the summer of 2016, it's pretty much been straight up. Uh, just incredible here at new all-time highs here again on Alibaba. What are your technical thoughts, B-A-B-A? -A? Uh, too high uh, to sh uh, too high to chase, too hot to short. I, I did technically see the levels where it's at and then some, uh, because as I just posted in the chart, I, I, I just threw in, in your chat room. And it looks like it, there's no double top talk because it exceeded the top from what 119 and changed almost 120 from way back then in uh, 2014. So uh, from here on out, it is just based on faith and what they say. They need uh, to say really good things to continue higher uh, or maybe just not bad things for the momentum to keep tumbling higher. But the earnings is a catalyst uh, event and it is binary. So I can't tell you how people are going to react to it. But the easier reaction is down usually when you're at all. Uh, is that all time high or high? It's all time high. Yeah. So I, I cannot chase it up here. This is one where I look at the chart and say, oh, I missed it. Uh, Nick, what about uh, your thoughts on Groupon? Oh, GRPN, is it? That tells you I don't look at it much, right? Um, yeah, right. It's, it's, too, it's one of those cheap enough stock to where I probably won't play the options on it. So if I believe it's going to bounce, and technically this has been a contentious level where I think there was an overshoot below a couple times uh, in 2015, but maybe they, I don't know what dro drove it down back then. If you know the situation and you think it was like a one-off, then this could be a floor. So if I were tracking it and I know its fundamentals are decent, uh, then I would take a flyer on it, but I would have to know their fundamentals or just playing it as a little lotto. Uh, so if it does bounce, there is a lower high trend that it would probably need it somewhere around $4. Uh, not to say it's going there, but if it does go there, breaking that, Lower high trend to the upside could add more momentum buyers, but you know there's not a lot of easy room behind it because at 450 another contentious level. And I'll throw a chart in there to kind of like uh, show, visualize what I what I just said for Groupon. So uh, that would be it. You know you'd have to know it. It's there's nothing exciting about it. Like compare that to Snap, where I bought it at the dip yesterday. I didn't buy it. I I went long it. Um, when it dipped and everybody said, you know, it dipped to 18 or whatever it was, I said, well, you know, everybody started to say on Snap uh, this or that. Uh, and th they're saying uh, strategy this and strategy that. And to me, it was very simple. I think they all missed the mark. Snap is a speculative play. 
It was speculated before the report. It still is after the report. You just have another opportunity to buy it at the IPO price. So I bought calls, sold puts, and here we go. Uh, Nick, question from uh, Flack in the chat. Uh, with the volume so low, is, is, it, is it a good time to look at calendar spreads, or do they work better with high volume? <laughs> well, volumes are low, so it puts a wrinkle in the uh, way I trade. If you're doing weekly iron condors, it causes you to step closer to the price, which means that you have a, um, a, highly, a higher chance of uh, drama. So... What I usually do is, if I wanted to still use options, I, I usually, believe it or not, I sell the calendar as opposed to buy it. For example, I wanted to take a flyer on a Home Depot lower. So I bought a few puts in Home Depot, but I financed them completely by selling way out, way out of the money uh, puts in Home Depot. So it was a free shot at shorting Home Depot. So even if I lose money on the puts, don't really care. Nothing came out of my pocket. Uh, so... I do use calendars. I do use diagonals, uh, but you, those you probably need a thesis um, in order to. Uh, it, they, they probably help you implement the thesis. And exi for example, if you expect a breakdown down the line or a breakout down the line, you buy calls that are out designated to catch that breakdown or breakout. But then you finance it along the way by selling against it shorter period of time. So if you pay three dollars to enter that outdated uh, that. Um, the strategy out in time, then you sell smaller premium shorter in time that expires worthless to lower your entry cost. Nick, ton of stocks are coming from the chat. So let's just pound through, maybe like take like 30 seconds on each one. Uh, Downward Dog, SWKS, which is Skyworks. The stock has just been a monster here, continues to run up. SWKS. Um, for me, it's one of those DHCA. It's just too high for me to chase here. If yeah. I'm not on board, I'll be buying somebody else's profits, period. Jumping over here to Dr. J wants to know about XLNX, Xilinx. Xilinx. Um, I, I've, whoa. Same, <laughs> same thing. Com <laughs> same comment. Well, the this other one, the Skyworks at least has still a bullish pattern that it could fulfill, which uh, it could have a lot more higher. He here, I would have to know why it needs to go higher because I don't see the same pattern here. Uh, jumping over here to, I uh, just had it here, um, uh, Downward Dog was just messaging me. He wanted to know about MKTX. I don't know anything about this one, smaller one. Market Axis Holdings. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I've, never, yeah, I've never traded this one before. MKTX. Okay, so it has a nice overall trend uh, on the weekly, so over five years. And if I still look at the weekly, there's an extreme tightness in price between higher lows, lower highs, coming to a point right around 190 to one from 190 down to 187, not 182. And so it's really tight. And usually when something is this tight after being a, a lot wider, uh, there's a move coming. Uh, direction is to be determined up to you. I don't know it. So. RD wants to know your thoughts on Twitter. It's been a monster here. I wonder if Brad still got it over there in the UK because this stock was a great pe purchase by him in the 14th. It's now 1923. Incredible move here for Twitter. Yeah, well, Twitter, I also sold puts in Twitter naked. Um, nice. I, I sold them in 13, and I closed those just before the earnings because they were big wins. And then I also sold at uh, 10 or 9, and those are dying on the vine for me for maximum gains. I did not buy the calls, but that's how I play Twitter. Up here, I can't chase it when everybody loves it. Everybody loved it a few times before, and it's disappointed. Yep. Um, so, you know, candles like these uh, make it really, really hard. I mean, that's the, like the definition of chasing, even though it could still go higher from here. Uh, Twitter for me is a I missed it darn it if I didn't already play it kind of a statement. Rob Hood P L A B which is Photronics. We're going off the board here again. P L A B Plab. Plab technically is <laughs> plab. risky if it goes above <laughs> where it's at right now. There's a neckline of sorts. Twelve bucks, uh, eh? Um, twelve bucks ish. Uh, that it could no not 12 like 1170 ish uh, that could bring it to 12 bucks plus um it, it's kind of like cup and handle ish uh, loosely interpreted uh, or inverse head and shoulder it depends where you draw the line but the spirit is there it has higher lows knocking on a roof which is around the 1160 to 1167 68 and if it busts through that then it could have more momentum upside Looking at FireEye, breakout there yesterday on all the hacker attacks there over the weekend. FEYE continues to be in breakout mode here this morning. It's up another 30 cents, 1620. Thoughts on FireEye? 
Fire Eye, it's another poke at another failure level from where back in September of 2016. So cautious chasing here. I'd probably watch what it does there and see how it handles that one poke up from then, uh, September. And uh, we'll see. Then I would chase it. I don't know what it's doing this morning, by the way. I did not look at the pre-open. Oh, yes, I did. Never mind. No, I didn't. So see what it does here that also i think fills a, the whole gap from then there's still like a little tiny corner of a gap open from way back in 2016 somewhere so i I'd, I'd wait a little bit especially after such a nice rip so whoever bought it at 10 ish or 12 ish you know is making bank and if i have profits in that you can stock replace so if you own it uh, and you don't want to be less long in it but you want to put less money on the table Yes, I sell the stock and I would buy calls that are in the money and out in time. Then I'm still long with a fraction of the, the, the risk I had before. Nick Shaheen, a pleasure as always. Thanks for providing the charts. You know, he's the author of Create Income with Option Spreads. We'll have you on again next week. Nick, talk to you then. All righty. Thanks, Nick. All right. Yep. Always, always a pleasure to get Mr. Shaheen on the line. 8.53 now. Got a couple minutes, and we're going to grab our final guest of the day just for a quick segment on dry ships. And before we do that, I want to talk about TJX, which came out at about 8.35 yeah. today. Q1, and let me pull up the chart there on Tinkerswip. Even the discount retailer is getting ahead here now, Spencer. Yep. I mean, we've had, the you know, obviously the big boxes and the traditional uh, department stores getting hit. Now the discount retailer, TJX, is trading down. Yeah, Q1 EPS, $0.82 cents versus $0.79. Cents. Sales of 7.8 versus $7.88 billion. Comps up 1%. So, uh, all in all, not a bad Q1 for TJX. Uh, not, They're just not liking retail not, right, right now. Right. They're finding a reason to sell it here. And if you look at TJX trading down four bucks here in the pre-market, there, I'm trying to bring up my chart for some reason. Well, it's, well, it's, it, it's the guidance. They, they they did affirm their outlook for the fiscal, yeah. for fiscal year, but their Q2 EPS, uh, they see 81 to 83 cents. 92 cents was the estimate. So there you go. Uh, and again, not a bad Q1. Not good Q2 guidance by any means, and like you said, they just hate it. They just hate it. I mean, this is this is a stock that's held on very well. A lot of the discount retailers have held up, but it's going to be concerning if they start hitting these as well. I'd look at, you know, if this thing gets hit, TJX, I'd be concerned about a stock like Burlington Stores, BURL, because BURL has been on a monster run too. That thing made a new all-time high actually just three days ago here, and now it cut through 100 and it's down seven points. It's actually down another buck here in the pre-market, probably because of the TJX numbers. Concerning if they start hitting that, because... You know, if the numbers are, eh, then, you know, you could get hit here as well. So I'd be concerned on any retailer right now. Yep. 8.55 now. We want to bring on a final guest for a quick few minutes. Jeff Goldman, uh, author of Fail Traders, the 20 Common Mistakes Committed by Over a 1,000 Losing Traders. So we're going to talk to him about dry ships and how this thing works. We'll be, we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back, traders and investors. We're on the line now with Jeff Goldman, author of the book Fail Traders, 20 Common Mistakes Made by Over a 1,000 Losing Traders. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going great, thank you. How are you guys doing? We are well, doing Jeff, good. We're, we're doing good here. Uh, I just want to say, you should have had an extra chapter there on the other failed mistake is buying dry shifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely... Uh... I mean, in my trading career, which is 20 plus years, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. that has gone on in the stock since since last March with uh, six reverse stock splits. I mean, it's just again, it's it's unprecedented the, the, what, what's going on with this stock. It's every other week. It seems like that they do another reverse split, and then the thing just leaks and falls 90 percent. They reverse split it again, and then it'll fall over the next month another 80 or 90 percent. They reverse split it again. Um, you were just explaining, to Joel, um, obviously offline, how, why this happens and you know how this works. First, you know, I just want you to explain to our listeners why do they keep reverse splitting the stuff. So this is this is what's called. I'm sorry about the phone in the background. <laughs> no problem. Other people ask about okay. dry ships too. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So this is what is called, and it's a great name, death spiral financing. And it's used mostly by penny stocks. Okay. Uh, it's huge in the penny stock world. And that's how uh, most of these stocks that you see that trade at two and three cents. And they trade you know, thousands of shares, millions of shares every day. And they have zero business, but somehow they stay open and, and keep the lights on. So what uh, death spiral financing is, it's when a company sells convertible debt to a private investors who specialize in purchasing the debt, and then the debt is converted to shares at a very deep discount to the current price. Uh, either there's a, different, there's a few different scenarios. Like for example, one, it could be you're allowed to convert the stock at like 50% of the current bid. Or another scenario is you can do like a moving average of the last month, for example, or usually it's the lesser of the two. So let's say the stock right now is trading at $5. These uh, investors that uh, purchase this convertible debt can now buy stock at $2.50. So what are you going to do with that? Well, you're just going to immediately sell it <laughs> because yeah, yeah. they the probably problem. have other convertible debt out there. So for it's, Big money for investors that are purchasing the debt uh, to the detriment of obviously the, the shareholders. But uh, for a company like Dry Ships, they can't get financing anywhere else. And they, they really are a real company doing real things. You know, they had, I think last, reven last uh, quarter, they had like 12 to 14 million in revenues. And it's a real company. And they've been buying ships left and right. So, but they can't get financing any other way. So this is what they do. So what happens then is uh, after a few of these uh, convertibles go on, the price falls dramatically and the amount of shares rises dramatically. And then they reverse the split and re uh, reverse the stock and do it again. And they just keep doing it. So they just keep doing the stock goes to zero and that was pretty close to zero. 50 cents, they reverse the stock. Uh, there's uh, obviously dramatically fewer shares. When they reverse uh, like right now, right now, Right now, there's 9.4 million shares outstanding. Okay. Okay, so there's nine, that's it, 9.4 million. But <laughs> over the last, like, since its inception, they've issued over a billion shares. So those shares have just disappeared. Think about that. They've issued over a billion shares, but since they keep reverse splitting them, they disappear. Uh, they just disappear. Yeah. So, so uh, basically, this, you know, if I'm getting this right, and just to summarize the point, so basically, you have the convertible debt, it gets converted into stock, which would create more stock. Um, and obviously, yes. then they reverse split it to get rid of that stock. So it maybe stays the same that they have the same amount of stairs, but the thing keeps going down. <laughs> right. So if you look at the market cap of the stock, which is simply the amount of shares outstanding multiplied by the stock price, that continuously falls. Right. So that just keeps going lower and lower and lower and lower. So the value of the company keeps going lower, even though all these crazy things are going on with the share price. Share price goes up, share price goes down, uh, 
shares outstanding go up and down, but the, the market cap of the stock is falling and falling and falling and falling. And right now it's, I think it's like a, is it 40 million market cap? Well, it's, it's like four that. times so that. It's, yeah. So say 40 million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> but again, this is very popular in the penny stock world. And that's, that's where you see all these penny stock pump and dumps. Right. Because the, the people that are pumping the stock are these investors that uh, are acquiring the shares and all they need are buyers of the stock because they've got stock to sell. They've got millions and millions of shares. And they don't care where they sell them. They don't care where they sell them. You know, if a stock's at $5, these investors, they don't care if they sell them at five, four fifty, four. I mean, they're buying stock at two fifty. And actually, uh, if they convert them in, di- in different uh, chunks, they actually, because the stock keeps going lower and they might have a stipulation in the convertible that they buy it at uh, like 50% of the bid, they get to keep buying stock lower and lower as the price goes lower and lower. So they don't care where the stock of the price goes. That's, that's the crazy part. They don't care. They're always selling. But the big difference is, is that this is, like you said, a real company. This is just the way it that they're is. financing because they can't get financing in any other way. So they keep issuing right. convertible debt below the market price. The, the debt gets converted, creates more shares. And then what happens is the price falls back down. They reverse split, get rid of those shares. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's pretty much, you know, the shares outstanding could, you know, remain the same or maybe they slightly fall. But at the same time, it looks like, you know, the equity investors just keep getting burned and burned and burned. And I mean, I just don't know how long this can go on for. Can it go on forever? I yeah, until <laughs> until people. Well, I, I did see some news out yesterday. That there's a couple uh, of the big class action lawsuit uh, law firms are actually looking into. They didn't officially file anything, but they're looking into it, uh, saying that they misled some investors. But other than that, yeah, they can they can keep doing this. This is uh, there are some. If you take it back over to the penny stock world, I know some penny stocks that have been in business for 15, 20 years, have never sold a thing. That's unbelievable. Not, 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 not turned a profit. They have never sold anything. That's unbelievable. And they always, and they switch like, you know, years ago they were uh, nano companies and then they were 3D printing companies and now they're all marijuana companies. They just switch. They can actually take the same company or the same shell that they're using, change the, the name of the company, change the symbol and just send, put out a press release you know, ABC stock is now into the uh, is searching for areas in the cannabis industry, and that's it. And then they and you say that buzzword just, cannabis, and investors get all excited, and they're yeah, they companies. get excited, and uh, yeah, so aren't even real. some of these, so in the death spiral financing world, it's all about you know just you're you're in the share printing company. Uh, you know, that, that's, the, that's the, the gist of what you're doing there is just selling shares to, uh, you know, pay, pay the salary. And, but in this yeah. case, the dry ships, they're actually buying ships. They actually just bought three ships. I think they have seven. It's, I mean, it's a real company, but it's a very volatile space. The dry shipping space Tough is a space. very volatile uh, space in terms of pricing. That's so can, things can be... Yes. All right. That's spiral financing. We learned something new here, Jeff. We appreciate you coming <laughs> on because I've never heard that term before. You said it here today, and obviously it's a you know, real just... thing. It's a real thing, and it, it pretty much drives uh, the the over the counter stocks, and uh, apparently it also drives drive ships. You, you could say it, it drives them. No pun intended. All right, <laughs> Jeff. Jeff Goldman. I'll be I'll be here all week, folks. Jeff Goldman. Thanks a lot for hopping on with us. We'll talk to you again soon. Not a problem. Thanks all right, all right, all right. Dennis, I'll let you go, and I'll wrap up uh, for the day. That is our show. Hope you enjoyed uh, Jeff com- Jeff's commentary right there. Uh, Mark Chaikin and Nick Shaheen will be on with you folks tomorrow. Looking ahead to tomorrow's show on our calendar, we have for you uh, Greg Harmon uh, and Victor Anthony, who is a new guest. Uh, Victor Anthony is a uh, an analyst, sell side analyst. We're going to talk to him about uh, earnings season and get his thoughts on his coverage uh, universe there. So Victor Anthony and Greg Harmon on tomorrow's show. We hope you enjoyed our show today. Please remember that all the information, material, and content is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice. 
Have a good rest of your day. We'll be back with you folks on Wednesday. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks.